spin gravity, airless voids, deadly dust, and the deepest cold. Space is the worst. I hated leaving Mars and my family, but travelling to space was worse than just missing my wife. Sadly, my job sometimes required me to travel, which isn't so bad when it's somewhere nice and, of course, on Mars. The taxi ride was the beginning of this particular journey. Collecting me from my front door, the smell of maple and birch in blossom filling my lungs, the soft green grass under my feet, the wait was pleasant enough, even the taxi was comfortable, the drone AI remaining silent as my preferences indicated, just collecting me from my home and heading for the heart of the city. Its sleek propeller drives whirring into action and carrying me above the houses of my neighbourhood, quickly bringing Helium Tower into view and smoothly accelerating towards the shimmering glass of the inner city. The sound of the city below was absent within the taxi, allowing me to settle back and enjoy the soft blue sky of Mars. It wouldn't be long before it was under me and the deathly black of space encircling everything. The journey was not long, perhaps ten minutes before we had landed, parking at the taxi rank outside the tower woods and the pathway to the interior of the forest that lay beneath the tower that would normally be my destination for work. After paying for the ride, I turned to follow the path under Helium Tower to the entrance gates for the elevator to Thuria. It was quiet at the moment, but I could see the elevator descending through the tower, sleek and silent as it approached. By the time it had reached the ground, I was already standing aside of the path, the gates disgorging a solid column of people from within. It took a few minutes for the passengers to disembark, and another few before the gates began to allow entry. I spent the time in my personal virtual space, organising notes and tidying up some graphs my intern had assembled. There'd be plenty of time to polish the presentation on the journey. Finally, the gates opened again and I snapped my attention to my route, heading aboard and up to the fifth floor, halfway from the ground and the top, the last deck to fill. Selecting a seat in the middle ring, facing away from the window, I don't like looking out at the void. As soon as I was settled, I returned to my work, fine-tuning my presentation by projecting recordings of my practice in my mind's eye, making notes and editing the script. It took almost an hour before the elevator was ready to depart, barely half full, because once you come to Mars, why would you leave? I'd rather stay, that's for sure. Ascents take around ten hours, longer than coming back, like an extra price for leaving. Still, the seats were comfortable and my virtual space was equipped with entertainment, though I chose to sleep rather than endure the noise of children running around the elevator and the sights beyond the disturbingly thin glass. My mental alarm woke me ten minutes before arrival at Thuria, enough time for me to gather myself up and prepare for departure, heading down to the gates and waiting for them to open. Finally, the elevator stopped and I pushed my way through the throng of people to exit the elevator and head for the shuttle train. The terminus was busy today, with numerous off-worlders scattered about, most from Earth as you'd expect, but a few were from further than that even a Laren lamb from Mercury. Sentient sheep with tentacles coming out of their head made me shudder. Ignoring the food bars and kiosks, I made for the train, sitting at the terminal already and heaving with people. I squeezed in on the front carriage and found a seat next to a woman nursing her child, while having a conversation with someone on the other end of her mind. It was a two-hour ride to the shuttle port, so I returned to my work, turning the volume down on my hearing to retain some sanity. Halfway through the journey, the woman's child decided to vomit on my suit, dragging me from my own mind to the apologies of the woman, attempting to wipe the stain off with a wet wipe. I excused myself and went to the lavatory. A little water let the vomit slide off my suit, leaving no sign it was ever there, 
probably the best part about this hideously expensive brand name suit. By the time I had returned to the passenger area, my seat had been filled by teen, so I stood in the corner and returned to my own world within. Eventually, the train arrived at the shuttle port, smoothly settling down before letting us out. This time I waited for a spell before departing. The busy train was not the place to rush around, and I had hours before my shuttle arrived. Rather than head for the port immediately, I walked into the streets surrounding the station, modelled in the style of New York on Earth. There were many shops and bars in this part of the city, bustling with people. Most, like myself, were Martians, but Thuria is the hub of travel for Mars, so there were many off-worlders here some running niche restaurants and entertainment services, but most were visitors. Selecting a restaurant, I sat and enjoyed a hand-cooked meal for breakfast, some dish from Karnath City, lots of meat, which makes sense for the Karnath. After enjoying the meal and paying, I returned to the streets and walked a pre-planned route past several artistic structures, parks and landmarks. Eventually, my route deposited me at the gates of the shuttle port. Heading through the terminal, I walked at my usual stroll, yet I still arrived before boarding began. The waiting room equipped with a window that looked out over Mars and the stars. The rotation and scene made me feel queasy, so I found a seat facing a wall. A nice wall, soft colours and decorative planters growing native Martian blossoms. My work and preparation were finished now, so I sent some mail off to the office and relaxed for a bit. Waiting for a shuttle boarding to begin, I spent my time amusing myself with virtual games and listening to a new audiobook, until the soft feminine voice of a Martian anima announcing the boarding was to begin. Many of those boarding were Martians like me. Most, however, likely lived on Deimos their clothing and accents indicating their origins. The shuffling queue of people boarding was slow, slowed further by some off-world human trying to queue jump and being sent to the back by the boarding staff, all the while complaining about having to wait. Obviously, he came from a colony where courtesy had died. After twenty minutes of the queue, I was finally able to sit in my coach-class seat. The company never sends me in first class. Even business would be better. Buckling up for the acceleration and tightly closing my eyes for the view, it was still another twenty minutes before the shuttle doors closed and that feminine voice once again sounded. The usual routine, safety lectures and departure alerts, a lyrical voice lost on this crowd. Finally, the shuttle departed the bay and out into the void. The utility nanolites were slow to react to the absence of spin, causing a sickening moment of zero gravity. I wish I hadn't eaten that breakfast. But before my food could visit once more, the nanites pushed me back to my seat and returned a sense of down, though it barely does justice to the real thing. Gravity at least has the decency to pull all of you down, the nanites failing to give my stomach that message. Even spin gravity, for all its quirks, at least tells your stomach which way the intestines are. Though I didn't have long to grow accustomed to the sensation, the engines of the shuttle kicking in and adding a new and equally uncomfortable feeling, pushing me back into the seat for a few minutes, time enough for me to wish it was over, and for my food to find its way down. The sudden start and stop of the engines caused several children in the shuttle to start crying and I heard at least one person make for the restroom. The shuttle journey was to take just 30 minutes, so I selected a channel and focused on the Martian news for a while, helping me ignore the view out of the window and the sensation in my belly. Reports about rising fish populations and Aurora City's bumper crop of tangerines did little to calm my stomach or relieve the sensation of dread. I don't travel off world well. The end of the flight was punctuated by another engine burn, this time pushing me into the seat belt, decelerating for the final approach to Deimos. Once a small ball of dust and ice, 
The moon was now a hundred times larger, a snowflake-shaped collection of rotating habitats. Once a wealthy shipping and mining colony, its exterior still suggested beauty within. Nobody on Mars considers it beautiful now. The poorest colony of Mars, and riddled with crime, you wouldn't go there if you didn't have to, or at least I wouldn't. The shuttle came to a gentle stop alongside a docking arm, the faint vibration of the airlock indicating the end of this leg of my journey. Collecting myself and preparing to depart, I saw the view from the window, the stars and Deimos still visible from this exterior dock. The view propelled my feet towards the doors, opening as I approached, but before I had reached them, the bulk of passengers were surrounding me and slowing me to a shuffle. Beyond the doors, the transfer train was waiting, passengers from the shuttle piling on and finding seats. It was hard to avoid being swept aboard by the throng of people. Soon I was seated and waiting for the stragglers, the train eventually departing as suddenly as the shuttle had, heading for the heart of the snowflake of poverty and crime. Fortunately, the train just took three minutes to reach Deimos Terminus and open its doors passengers pushing their way off the train and on to their own destinations. I was once again swept along for the ride and deposited among the many snack kiosks and information pillars, quickly heading for my next train and boarding it. I found a seat and sat, the carriage still filling with people, though the punctual train times ensured it did not get the chance to fill, though some of the passengers made me feel uncomfortable. A gang of youths in brightly coloured shirts, playing loud music and eyeing other passengers were the principal problem. The surveillance systems of the train, at least, would ensure my safety for the time being. It would be another half an hour before my stop, with a half dozen stops in between, but the nanite gravity was soon replaced by the less bothersome sensation of spin, my stomach finally settling down, letting me relax and in almost enjoy the time. Two stops passed, with the youths departing at the second. The constant changing of passengers did little to bother me as I waited for my station and the walk to my hotel, until a human woman, a natural born, and thus showing her age of decades, entered the carriage and began handing out digital pamphlets for her church, thrusting one at me with a smile. I shook my head but she leaned in and forced her mouth into a grin, so I accepted the file and stored it safely in my deleted files folder. Satisfied that I had taken it, she moved on down the carriage. Eventually, we reached Inner Pine Station and I hurried from the train, heading for my hotel in the best part of town. The streets of this cylinder city were busy with people, mostly of the Martian varieties, though Demas has a moderate population of Natura, not many off-world types, though, but then it's not exactly a vacation spot. The long, curved street was lined with bars, clubs, casinos, and the occasional shop, hundreds of holograms swarming the air just above my head, advertising drinks, dances, and games of the various establishments along this stretch. The walk took me through the busy street, passing islands of music and odours, each different from the last until eventually I reached the decorative front of the hotel, passing through rows of palm trees and into the expansive lobby. Rich blue carpet and uniformed staff greeted me as I arrived.